And after the, the invasion of Iraq, what happened was that the American forces took over the prison and started to write and you know, put people in there themselves. And here as well, we have Blackwater. Now, this is their old logo that they used to have. This company, Blackwater, has since changed their name, I think, two or three times, especially after the incident at the Suez Square. Uh, and to the CEO, Eric Prince, is now operating out of the Emirates rather than Iraq. So if we try to look at what were the scandals of Abu Ghraib, the abuses were basically where military forces, US military forces, abused prisoners uh, and tortured them. And uh, the abuses happened roughly March, late March 2003. In less than a year, there was a lot of media reaction because the photos that they took were leaked. And I remember speaking to a contact of mine who explained that, uh, of course, you know, the world was naturally shocked at what happened. But for the Iraqis especially, in Baghdad, the capital, uh, there used to be like a street market where you could buy DVDs. And so what happened was that you had CDs with the photos of the abuses on them being circulated at this market. So local Iraqis could buy the CDs and see you know, all the abuses that had happened. And so, of course, there was a lot of shock throughout the Middle East. Um, it's interesting to look at this case because it involved contractors, yes, but the majority of staff who abused prisoners were actually with the US military. They were not with contractors. But nonetheless, this is one of the cases that brought military companies to the fore. People started asking questions about them. What are they doing in Iraq? Why are we employing these people? Who are they? So Donald Rumsfeld, who at the time was the defense secretary, he said, uh, he gave a uh, statement where he said that at the time there were less than 40 contractors at Abu Ghraib, but nonetheless there was a lot of focus on them and what they did. So there are two companies involved, one of which, by the way, is now bankrupt. Uh, Casey, Casey International, as they're known, they supplied up to 30 interrogators, so the majority of interrogators at Abu Ghraib. And uh, it's interesting to look at their history with the US government because before uh, the, sorry, during the Cold War, they mainly had weapons contracts with the US government. After the Cold War, they began to do what's called intelligence gathering, which is a very vague term. And what made it even more vague is the fact that they had contracts with the US government to gather information, both publicly available information and classified. So for example, uh, as an analyst, I could get a contract with the government and they say, okay, we would like you to, to tell us what you know about let's say, Syria, and I can get publicly available information, compile it, put it together, but to make it easier for, for whoever I'm reporting to to read. That's not legal. That's fine. But what they did was a mix. They got both open information and classified information, and they were also interrogating prisoners with contracts that did not specify what they were allowed to do or not. So in the contracts that were issued to Casey by the US government, they were in charge of human intelligence, which is a very, very vague term. What does that even mean? You know, How they got their intelligence was not specified. And this was a problem, uh, because it comes down to accountability. Who, who do you blame when things go wrong? Now, as for Titan Inc., which is the second company, they were an IT company, and they also were meant to supply related intelligence gathering services. They supplied up to almost 5,000 translators from you know, English to Arabic, the Iraqi dialect of Arabic. Uh, they were hard hit. They kept denying that they were involved in the scandal. But what ultimately happened was that uh, they were going to merge with a massive, massive aero defense firm called Lockheed Martin. And after the Abu Ghraib scandal, Lockheed Martin canceled the contract. And eventually, Titan, I think they, they went down. So this is another thing I looked at, the fact that the public reaction to what happened. It's interesting that for one company, they got on with their lives, but for the other company, they lost a major contract. And why is that? Now, for Blackwater and the Sword Square, uh, here, well, let me ask you all a question. Look at this photo. Would you call these people soldiers or would you call them employees? Soldiers. Soldier. Right. And legally, you'd be wrong. That's interesting, isn't it? So you, you look at the way they dress. These people, you know, the sunglasses, the, the vest, but there's, there's, no, uh, there's no logo. There's no country or affiliation. Um, so they're actually, they're staff members. They are employees of a private company operating in Iraq. They're not soldiers, but they're fully armed. And 
What's interesting about private military companies, if you read more about it, is that a lot of uh, private military companies actually have former soldiers. And this is something that PMCs try to do. They try to get soldiers who are about to retire to come to their company. They say, listen, you know, we'll pay you a good salary. We'll offer you benefits. I had a meeting with a defense college in uh, the United Kingdom over a year ago, um, and I talked to them a bit about my book. Uh, they don't like to, this is a defense college run by the, the uh, uh, British military. They don't like to acknowledge the existence of private military companies. And one of the reasons, I think, is because they feel that private military companies are very for-profit and that they can even drain resources. Imagine if you have armed forces and you invest in training a soldier, and then five years later that person leaves for better pay in the private sector. You know. So anyway, in the Suez Square uh, in Baghdad, this is where Blackwater was accused and found guilty of killing or harming up to 17 unarmed civilians, opening fire on them. Now, this is a different, perhaps a bit more of a cleaner case study because unlike Abu Ghraib, at the source square there were only contractors involved, not soldiers. There wasn't a single US soldier on site, they were all working for Blackwater. At the same time, there were issues during the trial, so there was actually a lack of prosecution. This is another thing that I found. Um, it's incredibly hard to prosecute someone as a mercenary. You know, so the idea of someone being a soldier who's paid to fight for money, there's a legal definition of that, and it's not easy to fit that definition. So it's very hard to prosecute, and it's also you cannot prosecute the whole company. You can only prosecute or try to prosecute the individuals who are involved in the crime. So this is a, a rough account. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But basically, uh, what happened was you had a convoy of SUVs belonging to Blackwater who were trying to get vehicles in front of them to move. Um, something happened. The convoy opened fire on civilians, and then, you know, chaos started. So eventually, more SUVs arrived to try to get the crowd to disperse, but by then, damage had been done. So up to 17 people had then been killed. And this is probably the biggest case we've seen with the private military sector. I think the, the strongest case that brought a lot of focus to private military companies and why they exist and why they do what they do. So I tried to look at two things. How did the United States government respond legally, but also how did the public react? And to understand how the public, people like you and I, would react, I looked at news channels, and I looked at their headlines covering these events. How did they phrase these headlines? This is what we were talking about, political communication, rhetorical analysis. So I found it interesting that uh, two years after this event with Blackwater, the case was actually dismissed. So no one ended up being prosecuted in 2009. The judge, it was prosecuted at a US court. The judge argued that the prosecution had tampered with evidence. So the case was let go on a technicality, okay? In Iraq, what the Iraqis did was they withdrew Blackwater's license, which by then had already expired. So just to explain, uh, for most private military companies, if you're gonna operate in, for example, Iraq, you need to have a license where the government says, we accept that this company is on our territory, working for us or working for the Americans, and here's your license. So for the Iraqis, there wasn't much they could do. The license was already expired, they withdrew it. It was seen as symbolic. But at this point, so roughly 2007, this is where we see more and more criticism of private military companies. More and more scholars asking, what do these companies do? How much money are they making, and how do we control them? And uh, for those of you who have looked at international law, uh, because it's related to international relations, I'm sure you all understand that it's, it's meant to be very black and white. I mean, international law is meant to be a framework for states to keep each other in check, okay? And this is a problem because a private military company is a company. They are corporations, they're private. So how do we use international law to govern them? And there are some, I've written here, uh, E.L. Gaston, who's an author, he wrote a very interesting paper in which he argued that we need international law to change, that international law should now not just govern states, but govern <coughs> what we would call non-state actors, including companies. At the same time, what I found from my research is that you cannot maximize involvement without the industry. So going back to private military companies themselves, they are happy to get involved with regulation as long as it's voluntary. 
And this is a problem because I, I interviewed a person in Geneva who uh, has ties to private military companies. Um, I don't think he gave me his real name, but, uh, but basically what he said to me, he said, look, he said, we have frameworks that can be in place to govern how companies should work or not, but it's all voluntary. So he said, you know, if you want to be pessimistic, it's like saying, you know, if you adhere to international law, you get a nice little golden sticker on your company name. If you violate international law, you don't get the sticker, but people may still hire you anyway. There are PMCs out there that are willing to be aggressive because it's what their clients want. They want clients that are willing to get aggressive. They want clients who can, who are okay with violating law so that the client, if it be a state, their hands are clean. They didn't do it, but the company they hired did and they had no knowledge, you know. So they're isolated from all these acts. So if we're going to talk about international law, we should talk about the Montreux document and how it's implemented. And I'll discuss here what is the Montreux document exactly. So how is it implemented in Iraq? And how has the US gotten involved in law? Now, the Montreux document is not as big a deal as I thought it would be. It's important, but all it is is a document that restates existing international law within the context of corporate actors, private military companies. And it simply says that, look, states are responsible for how their uh, citizens behave abroad uh, and also their, their companies. So it is up to the states to actually determine how private military companies uh, operate or not. So for example, Blackwater, they're American, okay? So because of that, the United States government is responsible for how this company behaves in Iraq, or in Libya, or anywhere else. So if there's a violation, the United States should step in and should charge and prosecute. So the Montreux document itself, what it does, it, it determines what tasks private military companies are permitted to do. It also argues that private military companies need to have a licensing regime or framework. In other words, if a PMC hires staff members, that staff member should be vetted. That staff member should not have any past criminal record. They should be clean. And this is a problem because we have had issues where, what I was discussing just now, Blackwater employees who were on the verge of being found guilty of murdering civilians, they got away with it over a technicality. They go back to Iraq and they find a work with another company. This has happened. So the whole point of the Montreux document is to encourage accountability and oversight. Who is responsible? Who do you go to when there's been an incident like the Swiss Square or Abu Ghraib? So what has the US done? Well, as I was saying just now, the Montreux document is voluntary. Okay, so it just restates existing international law. It doesn't give us anything new, which is a problem. I think that, personally, as, as, as the author of this work, I think that we do need to have new laws to uh, control what private military companies can do when they're abroad. Uh, the US is a complex and interesting case study because they're both a home and contracting state. What that means is you can have a US company, okay, that, so the, the, the person in charge or the state in charge is the United States. The buck stops with them, if you like. But they then send that company abroad to Iraq. So things get more complicated. They're also a contracting state. What that means is the United States government may hire another company. It could be British, it could be European, who knows? They'll probably go with the, the best deal. And then that company, representing the United States as a client, goes to Iraq or goes to Libya. And often they go to countries where the law is weak, where you know if something goes wrong, the Libyan government, well, there is no Libyan government anymore. They can't, you know, they can't do anything. Same with Iraq, you know. Uh, and it's a problem because you see here, you know, with Iraq and Afghanistan, the worth of this market, and it is a market, is almost two hundred billion dollars. I don't know how much that is in lira, but it's, it's huge. Okay, I mean, it's 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 serious money, you know. Um, and so, and this is just from two thousand seven to two thousand twelve. One hundred and sixty billion dollars worth of contracts in Iraq. And Afghanistan, partly because of oil, but also because these countries are unstable. You know, if you go to Iraq, there's no way their government can guarantee your, your, your safety. No way. You know, so you need, you need security companies to step in and, and fill that vacuum. So there is in the U.S. a lot of regulation, legal regulation, to try to control private military companies. But the problem is a lack of prosecution for a variety of reasons. So one of the um, 
laws that I looked at that I found interesting is called the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, which is why I put major, because it's easier to say. And that act simply means that if you are a member of the US military and you commit an act abroad that would be illegal at home, you will be prosecuted. So if I was a soldier in the US military and I was in Singapore or Thailand and I killed somebody, I would be prosecuted. The problem with that is, again, we're talking about laws relating to the armed forces, not to private military companies. And so soldiers who have left um, the military and who now work for profit in military companies, this law does not help. And there's no law in the states that I'm aware of that actually will allow staff members to be prosecuted. As for Iraq, it's what we call the territorial state. In other words, it is the state where these companies go to because that's where their clients want them to go to. And especially we had uh, well, two things. In 2003, when the US was basically going to invade Iraq, there was an increasing need for these companies. In fact, the US was so eager to have you know, boots on the ground that there are two companies that got contracts to go into the states that they should never have gotten. Uh, one of them was Custer Battles, and they promised to have, I think it was 64 staff members on the ground in Iraq within two weeks, and they were given the contract. And they're no longer around, by the way. Uh, and they did not deliver. They hired, they had some American staff members, but they also hired uh, Gurkha, the Nepalese, so they used mercenaries to fill the gap. And what I found so shocking is the number of private military companies that came up in 2003, literally, there are a lot of companies where it's one guy and his home office. I kid you not, like there were, for example, a retired colonel from the US Army who used to operate in Iraq, he would say, okay, well, they need, America wants to have private military companies, uh, I still have contacts in Iraq, I'll start a company, I'll write strong paper and I'll call my contacts and, you know, we'll start to make some money. Literally, that's, that's quite shocking. Um, at the same time, what I find with Iraq is, as I said, they're not, it's not stable. You know, Iraq is not politically stable. So private military companies have gotten involved in things that perhaps they shouldn't have gotten involved in. So I was reading an article about how some of these companies, they strike deals with tribes. They strike deals with warlords to get access to certain areas and you know, get protection. That is something that the <coughs> government should be doing. They're getting very heavily involved in Iraqi politics. And the other thing that I uh, looked at is oil, of course. Iraq is still wealthy in terms of oil wealth. There's a lot of oil there. And it's very cheap to extract the oil, except it's not safe. So in roughly 2013, Iraq passed what's called the oil law, which simply means that private military companies, they are committed to operate in Iraq, but they cannot guard oil infrastructure. Okay? They cannot guard oil fields, they cannot guard uh, pipelines, and so on and so forth. Uh, why did they do this? They did this because one of the things that Iraq is afraid of is that a US private military company could come in, take the oil fields, and represent US interests. That Iraq will lose control over its oil bases if it allows too many private companies to just come in and guard these, these places. And so, yeah, and the final point here that I, I was going to make is just uh, going back to the Montello document, the idea that we should have international law um, protecting you know, people, you can't have global coordination. The, the United States has its own laws. Iraq is too weak to, to act as a partner. It's just not possible. So in my book, I've tried to define as best I can what is state legitimacy. And I'm still using this theory for my current thesis. So in a nutshell, a state can have a social contract between its citizens and itself. So for example, especially in, let's say, the Gulf states where they have a lot of oil. As a citizen of, let's say, the Emirates or Oman, I recognize the state's right to rule me in exchange for certain benefits. Because I get a free apartment, and I get free education, free health care, I don't care who's in power. And I don't care how they deliver, as long as they deliver. So the argument is that states could say, well, if you recognize our right to rule, and you consent to be ruled, how we provide, for example, safety is our business. So we have here, there are three criteria that are a bit misleading. Consent to be ruled, that, that, that's fine. Beneficial consequences, I allow the state to rule me because in exchange I get access to welfare or I get access to safety. And safety can be a commodity, remember that. Then we have the third misleading term, which is democratic approval. This does not mean that the people can choose or um, 
vote for every single major decision. It simply means that the state has a parliament, that they discuss how things are going to be done, and then they decide. So that means that if the state is in power, they can say, well, look, we discussed using PMCs and we all decided that we're going to do it. You know, so the people don't have a say. So you can argue, from this perspective, you can argue that it is legitimate for states to use private military companies if they decide that that is how they provide safety. The question then becomes, what are the criteria to make sure that there is safety? So I tried to look at the public perception of that, and what I found was very interesting. I found that regarding Abu Ghraib and Sur Square, most PMCs want to be seen, as I said, as security firms. It's a, ni it's a nice term in the military. It's less aggressive. It's very, you know, it's about protection and defense. And a lot of the media, they did call these companies private security companies, not private military companies. But then they used rhetoric to discuss how, for example, you know, private security company kills 17 civilians. Private security contractor charged with Abu Ghraib scandals. So it was meant to be a bit ironic. I found it very interesting that CNN, which is American, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, that they were the only media outlet that called PMCs military in their headlines. And I think with also the Abu Ghraib scandal, I'll talk about this in a second, one of the most interesting things I found was how companies can buy back legitimacy. So, Casey and Titan Inc. were seen as corporations. And this means that they, they weren't labeled as private military contractors or private military companies per se. They were called U.S. corporations in most headlines. Why is that important? Because if we return to the point of who's responsible, it means that if these companies are American, the American government is responsible for how they behave. It means that when something goes wrong, it is the U.S. government that should prosecute and that should hold them accountable. So we have corporate responsibility versus state responsibility. And this is a bit disturbing because it's as if to say that companies can kind of get away with it. The, the, the weirdest uh, result that I found was with the BBC, there were various headlines calling Casey a private military firm or a private security um, contractor accused of Abu Ghraib abuses. Once there was a settlement, because there was a settlement with Abu Ghraib, it went to trial, and Casey, they paid an undisclosed sum to the victims of abuse. And after that, the BBC started calling them defense contractors again. So it's as if they bought back their legitimacy. Suddenly, just because they bought people off, now they're a defense company again. So I have looked at how PMCs try to construct themselves, the way they describe themselves. Most of them want to be defensive. They want to come across as providing protection, not, not being aggressive. This image can be revoked by wrongdoing, but when that happens, it is states who are ultimately accountable. The public sees the states that um, these companies come from as accountable. So if it's an American company, the US government is accountable. People don't seem to have a problem with the use of PMCs. They have a problem with governments not disciplining them if something goes wrong. At the same time, as I mentioned here, a company can try to buy back its legitimacy. One uh, exception to this rule that I'll quickly mention is that when I published this book, it, this started as my master's thesis, by the way. So when I, when I, when I, when I was going to publish the book, I found that Blackwater, they were actually using very aggressive language as a private military firm, not defensive language. Even after the Source Square Massacre, they, they, they didn't say that, oh, we were in Iraq and did this and this, but they said things like, we are a military firm, we uh, operate in hostile environments. It's like they were using the image of being aggressive. And that tells me something about the market. It basically says that some companies, as we discussed earlier, they are happy to flirt with violating international law for clients. And that says something about how strong or not international law is and whether or not it can be used to govern these companies. So thank you very much for having me. Shabbat <laughs> Now we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, okay. So we have time for Q&A and discussions. So, so the floor is open for questions. I, I have some questions in my mind. I'm sure since we have our bridges here, I'm sure there are uh, some striking questions in their minds. Right? Yeah. I can, I can take a good question. Uh, there are some claims that these PMCs are 
appealing the violence and piracy, especially in Somalia, mm. in order to increase their chance of getting a contract by shipping firms. So what's your opinion regarding this issue? Uh, that's a very interesting claim. Um, I think that, you know, when I spoke to my contacts last, Iraq and Afghanistan remain the biggest and most profitable areas. Uh, I don't feel that private military companies would systemically do that, not necessarily because they want to be the nice guy, but simply because it is easier and more profitable to just say, let's continue operating in Iraq, let's continue operating in Afghanistan. Those places, they need security so badly that there's a ton of money to be made in those countries. Somalia, of course, you know, piracy, uh, especially on the, uh, on the high seas, in the oceans, they will need some security, but Iraq and Afghanistan remain the most profitable areas. So in my opinion, it is easier for a company to just continue operating in Iraq or Afghanistan, and perhaps also Libya, than to make trouble in Somalia. No. Well, I, I have another question. Who do you think the PMCs should be responsible to? Uh, the governments uh, or uh, international law system? I mean, uh, do we need the uh, international checks and balances system uh, to discipline them, or do we uh, need the governments? I think you need, yeah, so that's a very good question. I think you need a bit of both. Um, personally, I think that international law needs to be revised to take into account the power of non-state actors. You know, um, it needs to take into account the fact that these companies they operate internationally, and if they do a bad job, how do you hold them accountable? And it's not just private military companies, but you can, for example, what if you have an Italian oil company that operates in Libya and that you know makes a deal with a weak government to um, access the oil fields by sort of forcing people out of their homes because their you know their homes are built in the oil fields? There you have a situation where someone has to be held accountable. So you do need international governance for that. Uh, you need strong states to step in. Personally, I also think that it would help if each company like that was actually staffed with someone who represented a state and who represented international law and could keep an eye on them. Um, there is something in international law we call the doctrine of supreme command, which basically means that if you are, are in the military and you command, let's say, a battalion of 10 people, and one soldier uh, kills somebody or does something illegal, you should be aware of that as their commander and you can be prosecuted for not having stopped it. I think that that particular doctrine, although it applies to uh, laws of war, should also apply to private companies. So if I'm the CEO of a company and a staff member does something illegal, like in the source square, I should be prosecuted because I should be aware of it and I should stop it. You know, that that should that should happen in my opinion. There is another question. Yeah, anybody? Yeah, please. Uh, <coughs> do you know any actions taken by Blackwater besides Iraq and General Middle East? Uh, yeah, changing their name. They change the, like, they change their name yeah, to avoid do they, do they make any operations. Oh, okay, the other operations. Um, yeah. Well, um, as I said, they they've <clears throat> they started in Virginia. This is where they have their main compound, and they have done and continue to do training at in Virginia. Uh, in terms of operations, it is still mainly in the Middle East because unfortunately, it's it's the most profitable. Um, I do know that in Abu Dhabi and across the United Arab Emirates, Arab Prince he's now uh, moved into Dubai. He has a nice penthouse there and he's training soldiers on behalf of some of these sheikhs or some of the um, monarchs in Dubai. So that is a very interesting case study because um, when the, have you heard the blockade that started between Qatar and the rest of the, yeah. When that started, that was actually a point that came up when they were you know, talking about you know, who was really the bad guy. Um, I know that Qatar has brought this up and others have as well that uh, the Emirates are using uh, well, Eric Prince's soldiers, if you like, or staff members, to train their own soldiers for crowd control. So, you know, he's still operating in the Middle East, but obviously that kind of operation is less, it's more subtle than going in and, you know, going in done blazing it up, but it's still, you know, legally it's a gray area. Yeah. Yeah. Your thoughts, imagining an international system where these checks and balances can be implemented on PMCs, uh, wouldn't this be like non profitable? Let's just take Wagner, for instance, yeah. Russian country. Yeah, yeah, sure. They use them as you know, expendable boots on the ground. So if they are in the front lines, let's just give an example. If they were in their resort, like 
three weeks ago, mm. US bombed them, mm. 76 members of Wagner were dead, I have the list, everyone has the list. Mm. And like what they were doing there, question one. Question two, US killed them, what mm. will Russia do, what should Russia do in order to, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. to club the bear. But since they are not members of the military, and they are members of a private military company, so Russia does not have to retaliate and therefore risk open conflict with the US. <laughs> So yeah. they are great tools for states to implement their show of force yeah. in remote regions. So uh, especially members of the United Nations Security Council, <coughs> they wouldn't agree with an international system where they can check and control and ask for accountability yeah. for these policies. No, but that's very, very true. I, 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 I hate to agree with you, but you're right. You know, um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the current legislation is voluntary, uh, and you cannot have legislation without involving PMCs because you have to, you know, in order to present it as palatable and to look good, how can you have legislation where PMCs don't agree? And if they're going to agree, they will have certain demands, one of which is that you don't refer to those PMCs but as security companies, and the other is that it's all voluntary. So, and this is the problem. So I don't, I, although I would love to see that international system we were just talking about, I don't see it happening because as you just pointed out, the use of private military companies is a way of avoiding political symbolism. So as you just said, because we're talking about staff members being used, not soldiers, to Russia, it doesn't look like it's so big. So they don't, they're not going to retaliate. And for all you know, maybe Russia would do the same. You know, It's a way of getting, you know, get, getting dirty politics done without making a big deal out of it. And unfortunately, this is true. Something to write an article about. Yeah, it's like a shortcut. Yeah, it is. It's very true. Hmm. And the thing you mentioned about changing the name, like security companies. Yeah. Uh, let's give an example for Turkey. There is this company called Salat, okay. which is a PMC. But they say we are a security company. And when people were arguing, like, is Salat uh, accountable? Are they legitimate? Uh, and everyone was talking about, okay, they they can use Salat to use to use them as tools for crowd control, or when yeah. there is a case of civil war in Turkey, they can just support the government. Mm -hmm. but, then the CEO of Salat came out and said, no, we are the private military company, but rather we are a security company. And then the discussion stopped in the Turkish media. So this, this naming is so convincing for the people. It is, it, no, but it's a very good point. I mean, for example, Blackwater, I don't even know what their name is now. Academy, I think. The yeah, name that's is it. Academy. Yeah. And I think they changed it twice, but uh, it was XC Services, now it's Academy. Yeah. Even the term Academy, it's, it's like academia, academic. It's the idea of teaching and training rather than you know getting Militarily involved, and that is probably the image they were going for, you know. So that's a very good point. You know, there's a lot in the name. <laughs> no. I have a question actually uh, regarding, you know, when I was following the most recent discussions around Turkish Afghan operation and people being talking about mercenaries. So yeah. similar to that, in that case, again, non-state actors who are not affiliated with any state over there, yeah. or uh, feel themselves as a nation like no foreign soldiers, no. they are not troops, it's not like this, so what I see mm -hmm. is that there is a trend going towards a new type of a warfare, a new type of an activity going on, so how do you see its future in the coming years? Well, it's, it's interesting because... So because mean, one day you are fighting for me, the other day you will be fighting for another guy. Yeah, for so the highest bidder. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's, that's a very good point. And, in fact, this is a problem that international law still has not addressed because there is a six-point definition of what is a mercenary. If you fit that six-point definition, you can be prosecuted. But the thing is, it's not good enough to fit one out of six. You have to fit six points out of six points. And because of that accumulation, it's very hard to actually be classified as a mercenary. <coughs> you see? So, for example, uh, you have to be fighting. You have to be able to prove that you're fighting for pay. You cannot be a party to the conflict. You cannot be uh, from a member nation of the conflict. So, for example, what if there's a war between, uh, I don't know, let's say there was a war between Libya and uh, Afghanistan, and you have a Libyan mercenary who's fighting not for Libya, but for, just for money, but he's Libyan, so he's a, na a national, so one of the parties in conflict, so you can't prosecute him. And this is a problem. It's an ongoing issue that mercenarism is very hard to define. There's no, uh, there, well, there is the, the legal definition, but it's so hard to fit that you can't prosecute using that. So, you know, and it is a problem. So maybe it's a way of maybe your case in that sense. Show us the coming quality of the world in the coming years. 
So maybe we are now the concept of nation state is re will be redefined. So what will be understand from guys who are protecting our nation will be different than you know conventionally. Yeah. Maybe we'll be think twice about our recruitment uh, so soldiers in our country. It's, it's quite possible. Uh, I was just about to so say, in I never Turkish mentioned. case, let's say, in order to serve for army, it's a privilege yeah. to be served in the right. army. Maybe we will think twice about that. So um, yeah, I mean, it's possible. I mean, there, there are, you know, there are a lot of people, I think, who genuinely want to serve their country and who go into, let's say, you know, the armed forces with an open mind, but they, they do it to serve their country. Uh, people who think like that, were, I think, not sort of, you know, switch to go to a private military company just for money. But then again, you never know. I mean, if the if the rates are attractive and you want to feed your family and take care of them, and you say, okay, well, with uh, say Singapore's or Norway's military, I get paid this amount, but these guys over here offer me this amount, and they're going to pay my health insurance. They're going to pay, you know, and that may or may not happen. I mean, there's been cases, for example, uh, there was a mother who uh, was interviewed where her son was killed in the dock. Uh, he was working for Blackwater, and one of the reasons he was killed is because. The equipment he was meant to get, uh, protective vehicles and stuff, never arrived. So when he was told to go into a dangerous area, he was just shot. And again, because he's not part of the military, then you know, prosecuting the company is not possible. Um, the company had a contract with him that was very vague, and they didn't actually make certain promises that they were supposed to make. So it works both ways. No. Um, I mean, in terms of mercerism, I was going to say I've never met the mercenary, but actually I have. Um, or at least I think I have. When I was in Lebanon, I was staying in a hotel in Beirut. And I met uh, a couple of people who, um, they were Irish, and uh, they said, yeah, we're going to Syria tomorrow on behalf of the UN. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't believe that for a second. <laughs> uh, they didn't look, they, they looked, so they looked ex-military, you know. And so you will find, you know, mercenaries do exist, but prosecuting them is hard. And, you know, mercenaries, they may have their reasons. Sometimes, maybe this is all they know. Uh, and there's so many sides that would be interested in using yeah. mercenaries or companies. If it's not going to be a company, it could be a handful of mercenaries, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe it's more discreet. But, you know, so it's, it is the way it is. You know, as you said, it may change how we think about national states and security across borders. You know, it's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Any other question? No? Okay, then we thank our experts for being with us. Very welcome. So you can join us on our way way back to campus. Maybe if you are would like to ask something privately. Anyway, so thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.